Okay, uh, very good morning to all of you, or good afternoon as the case may be. And welcome to the Early Career Network workshop of the APAC 2020. On behalf of SLMA and APAC and ECN, let me welcome all of you for this very important workshop, all the resource persons and all the participants. And we have got a very good, excellent response from everyone. So looking forward to a great workshop. I am uh, Indika Karnatilaka, professor in medical education. And uh, here I will be, we are in three hats actually. One is the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, the organization co-host in this year's APAC. Second, as the vice president of APAC, because this is the APAC 2020 conference. And thirdly, uh, as the senior advisor of Early Career Network. So without further ado, let's move into the workshop. The main objectives of the work workshop is to have a discussion among ourselves that would be beneficial for the early career public health professionals regarding the different opportunities that are available at the global health and public level, health level, the leadership opportunities that are available, and also to guide them. And we have very three eminent, three very eminent resource persons, and uh, I mean all of them are ideally suited for this objective. And uh, I'll get three of them, Don, Koji, and Kremlin, who have been at leadership level for many years. And uh, Kremlin was at one time easy and chairperson, and uh, Don has worked very closely with uh, APAC and Koji too. So let me ask them to res uh, introduce themselves and then get the workshop started. Out to you. Thank you very much, Professor Indika. Welcome everyone, wherever you are, whether I see uh, friends from Australia, from Nepal, from China, Taiwan, and from Africa. So welcome to the workshop. We want to, we will make this lively and interactive. Uh, I'm sure there's something new for us. So we're moving forward to the new normal. I am Don, I teach with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the University of the Philippines recently the country director for Access Health International. And I also founded uh, Global Health Focus, which is pretty much what we will be doing now. We provided you the background of the speakers, of the facilitators. We will not be speakers here, by the way. This will be an interactive workshop. And let's go to uh, Koji to introduce himself. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Um, I am a Koji Kanda. I am a currently in a senior assistant professor in Asahikawa Medical University of Japan. That is uh, one of 82 medical university and uh, north, northern part of the university in my institutions. Um, I have uh, several experience on uh, global health research, both in Asia and Africa. Um, I used to stay in the University of Peradenia in Kandy District of Sri Lanka. And I also had uh, experience in a social security hospital in Panama. And uh, in Japan, uh, I spent four years as a JIC officer for the technical cooperation for public health project in Asia and Africa. And I was also dispatched to the Myanmar for the malaria control with uh, collaboration of the Ministry of Health in Myanmar. So I hope today, you know, next three hours, we have a very good discussion to think about our future, like career development as a public health official. Thank you. Kremlin. Thank you, Don. Hope you can hear me. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. And uh, I'm Kremlin Vikramasinghe uh, from the World Health Organization Regional Office for Europe. Uh, I'm, today I'm joining you from uh, Moscow, Russia. It's uh, 6.30 in the morning here, but I'm sure all of you are hopefully ahead of my timeline, not behind. And so I'm originally from Sri Lanka. I studied at the uh, Faculty of Medicine Colombo, where Indika is a professor. So it's great to be connected again. Uh, as Koji mentioned, I connected with APAC uh, also when I was a medical student and a long time ago. And then uh, I graduated from medical school and did a uh, master's in global health science at the University of Oxford. 
and then a P my PhD also in public health in Oxford. And I worked there as an academic. And recently I joined the WHO, a European region, where we cover 53 countries for non-communicable diseases. So my work is mainly around non-communicable diseases. I look forward to talking to you uh, today and interacting with you and during this workshop and also getting to know your work. Thank you, Don and Kaji. Thank you very much to the facilitators. The workshop for today, we will try to be very interactive, no major speeches or, um, or any other major presentations. And since there's quite a number of participants, I think we are expecting 90. Whenever probably we call you later on, you can do a short introduction and mention who you are or where you come from. And you already received the guide of the workshop. It's on the chat. And I think it was also sent through your email. There will be three sessions for today. We have uh, session one. We will try to understand the landscape of global health and public health leadership. So we will focus on that for one hour. Then for the second hour, we will have the opportunities post-pandemic. So we will try first to see the landscape, what happened and what challenges were brought to us. And then for the third session, we will try to reflect on we as uh, emerging leaders in public health or as young professionals and uh, in the middle part of our careers, how we will navigate these opportunities. So for the first session, we have the guide questions on what are the challenges and changes that have been brought about by the pandemic? And how did the pandemic affect us professionally, individually, and globally? To uh, provide the landscape, we will have an introductory presentation uh, to be given by, to be delivered by uh, Dr. Kremlin, who is now in Moscow. Kremlin, you can share your uh, slides, please. Thank you, Don. Let me start doing that. Uh, hope you can see it, Don, now? Yes. Just put it on uh, slide uh, mode, uh, yes. slide presentation mode. Thank you. OK. Everything is fine. Yes. Great. Well done. Yes. Thank you. Right. Uh, yes, Don mentioned. Uh, yeah, we are trying to take you through the challenges, but we are trying to integrate two things, bring some of the content, but at the same time, uh, talking about challenges we currently face and what kind of new skills we should have going forward from the pandemic. And uh, so I will focus a bit more about my work in CDs when I talk about challenges and Koji later on will touch a bit about as an academic, what kind of challenges you face in academia. So that's how, so we will bring our personal professional work and our content with the framework of uh, current challenges and what should be done differently. So yeah, so a bit about myself, I already told you, that's a medical school where I indicate teach on the top where I studied and the other places where I studied and worked and uh, Moscow NCD office uh, where I currently work. Today I'm joining you from home, of course, Sunday morning. But uh, that's my journey so far, very briefly uh, up to now from Colombo uh, to Moscow. Uh, and uh, yeah, disasters and pandemics, are they opportunities or threats for our career? I think it depends on what we do at that time. I was a medical student when the tsunami disaster happened in 2004, December, almost finally a medical student. And that's the time where we had to pick a research topic for our final year public health in Sri Lanka, we call community medicine uh, medic undergraduate project. And I immediately talked to my supervisors and that was Dr. Karunathilaka, Indi Karunathilaka, and I decided to do my research in the uh, tsunami affected areas because we were one of the first respondents to go there. So I could do my first research there and publish my first paper there. That was my introduction to public health on the ground beyond what I had been learning in medical school. And that gave me the opportunity to go to APAC 2005, the top right hand side photo, the early career network workshop where I presented my first research. 
So I think that was the start of my global health career, which then ended up in organizing several ECN workshops and becoming the ECN chair uh, with Professor Walter Patrick, who was the founder of APAC, you might have heard, and then through that becoming to the editorial committee, editorial board of the Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health. So I think that tsunami disaster in my uh, personal career, uh, I was able to turn that it was a sad event. We know in any disaster or any pandemic, there's a lot of negative health consequences, but towards for global health, they inspire many people to get into global health and to come to the field. And that's how we look at it. So I just wanted to share that aspect. Right, now I come to my topic. It's about non-communicable diseases and what happens during a pandemic, what new challenges we face and how can we prepare ourselves for future. We all know in any region, high blood pressure, smoking, obesity, cholesterol, alcohol, unhealthy diets, these are one of the top risk factors in terms of health burden. And these are all associated with non-communicable diseases. What happens with the COVID? Everyone forgot about those, the top killers and start just focusing on COVID. And still more than two thirds of the diseases are from COVID, but people who die from COVID or people who get into an ICU from COVID or people who get an, need an ICU ventilation have diabetes, severe obesity, heart disease or cancer. More than 90% of them have an MCV. So there's a very close connection in the severe outcome of COVID and having NCD or an NCD risk factor. On the other hand, lockdowns, restrictions means people can't do much physical activity. They are doing more and more Zoom calls, sitting down, no walking between meeting rooms or to workplaces. And also primary health care is pretty much restricted, not going for their routine medical checkups for blood pressure or uh, diabetes and also uh, postponing routine, routine medical care. There's some disruption to the continuity of care and this is all going to be negatively impacted on NCVs. So there's a very close connection as we pointed out uh, very early in this pandemic uh, through our Lancet piece, which has now got some momentum. Now people have started to look at NCVs through the lens of COVID-19 or the vice versa. And that's the, I think the new challenge we have now is how to connect our work to the current context and all these changes, how can we apply it for future? I mean, a very basic thing to start is nutritional management of COVID patients. Hospitals did know how to manage the nutrition of uh, different types of COVID patients, either mild patients or severe cases. And what kind and, and, and almost nutrition management was neglected at the early stage, which really impacted in their recovery after the ventilation. And uh, then we were able to put this paper together and which kind of gave us some information and countries have started uh, using uh, information now uh, to adapt. Then not for the COVID patients, for everyone else during this pandemic. And we were giving normal nutritional instructions to the public. But when the COVID came, when these uh, lockdowns came, the, the normal information did not, uh, were not valid anymore. We had to tell them what can you do during quarantine? How can you eat healthily and self-quarantine? And these kind of information we had to adapt and start giving it to the public. And one of the biggest change we have seen in many countries is the online food delivery apps. And because people are not going to restaurants, they started ordering on apps, multiple time expansion, out of home food sector grew in some cities to say that more than 50% of the calories were coming from online food delivery apps. May not be in some countries where they are still have the culture of home cooking and enjoying home cooking. Uh, we know online food delivery apps don't have any nutrition information. Five years ago, this was a very small, proportion and we could even neglect it. And we could neglect the post and choices of online food delivery. But today we cannot ignore it anymore. Still, we don't understand as public health experts, do they provide nutrition information? Do we know their portion sizes? Can we collect any data? 
actually know most cases. So how can we bring this food, uh, online food delivery, similar to nutrition labeling, uh, to provide information for consumers, to help consumers to choose healthy dishes and collect that nutrition data for national level research. These are some of the challenges we learn now and where we need to apply. And this online food delivery escape is going to expand even after the uh, pandemic, given the current uh, context. And next, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, sorry, physical activity. As you know, people are mostly staying at home or they're reluctant to go to gyms, crowded places, can we give them the skills that they could do something simple at home? This type of communication was much needed during the lockdown. And maybe some people found time since they don't travel to start some activities at home. How can they give them some basic skills as a beginner? And how can we help them to stay active beyond the pandemic? Alcohol. This is also partly misinformation. In some countries, there are world social media news going as alcohol can protect you against the virus. So how can we provide information with the right evidence base about alcohol and COVID-19? And alcohol has brought in some new people for drinking. While pubs, restaurants, social events are not happening, alcohol intake is going down for social events. But at the same time, some are going to alcohol for isolation, for mental health issues, or uh, for various other stress-related issues with loss of jobs and other things. And this plays a different uh, approach for us to do alcohol control. And some other messaging such as breastfeeding during COVID-19 had to be a different messaging. And prisons, we already know, already causing problems in many prisons with the COVID spread. How do we manage that? A uh, lot of people can't smoke inside the apartments or so places outside in the cafes are not available now. They're not going to cafes. And that means a huge surge in use of electronic cigarettes, ordering online electronic cigarettes and different liquids. So we had to do a massive campaign, which we are now setting up to provide information to consumers about the health harms of electronic nicotine delivery systems and heated tobacco products. And supporting governments to regulate the marketing, especially digital marketing of these products and rapid expansion. And beyond, beyond the pandemic, we need to look at that. As I mentioned, obesity is one of the highest risk factors for COVID. The research linking obesity and COVID seems to be one of the most important research links at the moment. We can predict the severe outcome of COVID based on obesity. But unfortunately, when people take PCR, they don't take the height and weight of patients. So we have a very easy opportunity if we know the obesity level at the time of taking a PCR, to a more than 70% or 80% accuracy to predict who's going to get worse outcomes, who need hospital admission or ICU admission. And that's where we need more researchers to apply that and take this opportunity to bring obesity prevention into the mainstream of policy. In some countries like UK, Prime Minister said, obesity prevention is going to be part of COVID-19 response strategy. So calorie reduction, and some of those activities came into COVID-19 response strategy because we cannot forget obesity and just talk about COVID-19. So using this opportunity to link obesity and COVID-19 is another way to use the uh, pandemic, but also going beyond the pandemic to strengthen our obesity prevention approaches. Digital marketing. Children are spending more and more time online what does that mean? They are getting exposed to more and more digital marketing without being noticed. Coming up with methods to monitor that is really difficult, but using technology to monitor, to quantify children's exposure to digital marketing helps us to show it to policymakers. And these type of research are much needed and we need to scale up and continue beyond the pandemic because this children's digital environment, learning environment will also grow, will change as a result of the pandemic. Uh, finally, I'm coming to two topics, about primary health care. As I mentioned, for non-communicable diseases, we want primary health care. We were in a journey to strengthen primary health care to provide different uh, resources, services through multidisciplinary approaches. Now, many people are 
not encouraged to come in contact with primary health care unless it is urgent, right? So normal things such as getting advice on a healthy diet, how to quit tobacco, how to uh, reduce alcohol intake, these services people are not encouraged to come in contact with primary health care because they are not considered urgent. At the same time, some primary health, some countries, primary health care centers are trying to become online or telephone advice to people. Now, there are two things. How can we still feel that community is connected with primary health care, not disconnected? We can't let our primary health care system become completely a vaccine, vaccine delivery system service for the next year. They need to provide other core services. And also address NCDs, which cause two thirds of the disease burden. So how can we keep our primary health care system still relevant for the disease cause, trusted by the community, but still provide these services in a safe manner, either through telephone or online, but still uh, with the trust of the community is going to be a challenge. And so there's lots of research, implementation research, cultural adaptation research that we could do around primary health care to maintain these essential services. And then misinformation. There's lots of work around misinformation through social media these days. The spread of misinformation is going fast. We can do research about people's exposure to misinformation, how people perceive them, and what changes does that cause in their, uh, in their behaviors. Also obesity and uh, sugary drink consumption is becoming increasingly important. And we are trying to propose drinking water at home, reducing plastic waste, linking the environmental agenda, because it's very easy to forget climate change, environment agenda, while we are focusing only on COVID. How can we keep those topics online? Finally, I come up to about this issue, capacity building. As WHO, we used to do lots of capacity building exercises like the two photos you see on right hand, getting people into the rooms, training our future workforce. Now we had to adapt to online like this we are doing today. So we launched a seminar series from our office to bring these young people to online NCD seminar series and monthly running these sessions. So how can we adapt training through online platforms and not just these seminars, things such as I used to train people, uh, support countries to monitor trans fatty acid levels. That means we used to run training in labs about measuring trans fat in food. Now this we are still struggling to uh, deliver online. So there are some challenges how some competencies could be delivered through online that we need to learn. So these are some of the topics I tried to match with our current work, but still which we are finding as challenges uh, for the, uh, uh, during the current pandemic and also where we might need some sort of new approaches and skills for going forward. I'll stop here now, but I'm very happy to continue with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you very much, Gremlin. We can, uh, we want this to be interactive. If you have questions uh, on the presentation, please uh, either write it on the chat or you can raise your hand. So what uh, Kremlin provided us today is one example of the scenario based on, on one of the fields of global health, which is NCDs. And that is his work with the World Health Organization. Now what we, do next is ask the part workshop participants on their experiences on what is the impact of the pandemic, either at the micro level, which is personal, at the meso level, which is your institutions or organizations or universities, or at the global level. If you can write on the chat, what is the impact based on what you think, and probably you can mention the country, or you can raise your hand if you want to speak. So any um, volunteer who would like to speak on, on the impact of COVID-19 on themselves, on the society and in global health. While you are thinking, I would like to ask uh, Kremlin, Will, did the NCDs got more worse after the pandemic? Will it just add to the global burden of disease on top of the infectious uh, uh, COVID-19 that is happening now? And what would it mean for, for the jobs of the, of, of the young emerging professionals if there are more 
health issues that we have to handle while they are thinking, Kremlin? Thank you, Nan. So for your first question, I think it got to us definitely. And there's no question about that because as I mentioned, less people, less uh, people are going to primary healthcare for their routine checkups and prevention services. And also uh, there have been disruption to duct delivery for simple things such as hypertension or diabetes. And we know these uh, and cancer services had to be paused in many countries. So definitely NCDs got worse. I think uh, that we all agree. And now what it means for uh, future jobs, I think many things. Uh, on one side, what I also observe is WHO stopped the internship program, right? So graduates who came out last year, this year, really struggling to find the internships. And I did the internship in WHO when I finished my master's and I was fortunate to get that internship, which was a real boost for my career. Then go to the next job and even to come back to WHO 10 years later. Now that's something we need to think about, right? Like, because sometimes those internships would have given us the first stepping stone for a job. That's what we are losing now. But still, I think many companies have uh, many, many organizations are offering online placements. So it's not gone. I think it's a different kind of space where we should try and try to find that. So it's not going to be physical placement, which gives you extra benefits, but still maybe now without money, because sometimes when to go to Geneva or somewhere else, you need also wanted funds. Without funds, you might be able to do a placement from another country. So it also comes with a certain opportunity. Uh, that's what I would think, and, and, and I completely agree that COVID has given people completely different research topic to understand in the new lifestyle, what it means for many of the behaviors and health practices and health, doing health economics assessment. So all those models that we earlier had doesn't work in the current climate. It's completely new normal of operation. So if you can adapt your skill set to that kind of research where all the organizations are currently commissioning, uh, that will be helpful. So in uh, other words, uh, the pandemic fortunately uh, opened a lot of possibilities and opportunities for all of us who are in the field yeah. of health. Yeah. Uh, Professor Indika would like to say something, please, before I read the other yeah. questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, till the others get their comments and uh, thoughts on. Yeah, uh, just one word, I mean, social determinants of health because uh, pandemics don't affect everyone equally. And Kremlin mentioned about the NCDs, lifestyle, nutrition. So the, the communities that, that are affected by the pandemic because of the nature, say uh, the underprivileged communities with poor socioeconomic status, we are a lot of people, a lot of crowding happens, poor ventilation, poor hygiene. All these are basically the, the fertile ground for COVID. And, and, the, and the impact doesn't affect the whole community in an equal way. And when it comes to NCDs, NCD management, or access to healthcare, nutrition, healthy lifestyle, with the worst affected, affected are the people who are most affected or most like to be affected by the pandemic. It's observed all over the world, I think. So that's something that we can think about. Thank you very much, Professor Indika. We have a few questions from yeah, the no. group of participants. I think one is on mental health, which is another major issue. Can you please comment on that, Kremlin? Yeah, this, this is a major issue. And we all know that uh, mental health services are affected. And also with loss of jobs, social determinants of health, with all the pressure coming in, uh, the services have reduced and uh, the risk factors have increased. So with that, uh, this is a major burden. So WHO European region launched a flagship initiative this year called Mental Health, thinking about new ways of reaching people, support lines and community uh, online support. But I don't think uh, that's going to solve all the problems to getting to the most vulnerable. This is a major challenge and health systems will have to continue to adapt and try new ways of reaching people not waiting until the pandemic is over. That's in summary, I can say, but there are a lot of new tools coming out like, like our flagship initiative. So don't assume that we are all waiting, but try to be proactive and go and reach out the new tools and online assessment tools and services and best case studies that are coming out 
to keep up to date with those latest development. Now, there was a question to me, I think it came through a private chat about uh, uh, how do you address the impact of COVID-19 and Ganga, how can we measure the soft skills of such internships? I think she's measuring to the internship I mentioned, like distance internship. I completely agree. We might never be able to assess how they operate as a team member. But I have two uh, interns who started last July. I have never met them in person, only through online. I would be waiting until I have some funds to give them a short contract. So on others, I don't know if they came to the office, I would have the same impression or not, right? But they have performed very well, knowing that they can't ask the chat. Like if there's an intern, they always meet us and ask something during the coffee. They didn't have that opportunity, but we had to communicate formally by email, by calls, Zoom calls, but the high quality and the efficiency of delivering products, I'm super impressed. So I know maybe certain skills you were not able to demonstrate, but some others might have also been winners who, who like to work in this kind of a field without any pressure of being in the middle of the attention. So I don't think that will stop careers for everyone, but I completely agree the challenge we can't assess the soft skills. Uh, that's my response to that. Don't quote you. Thank you very much, Kremlin. So in this workshop, you see we have our emails and if you want uh, to look for opportunities, probably we can provide uh, some opportunities. If you want to work in Moscow with Kremlin as an intern, <laughs> just be sure that you are, uh, you, you are not affected by the cold weather. It's a very nice place, uh, definitely a very nice place to visit. So yes, uh, I also had an experience where I had to arrange a new graduate from University of Edinburgh he wanted to do an internship. It was approved, but it, it was in Cambodia. Unfortunately, COVID affected the visa procedures, those kind of things. So we had to wait a bit. I also have another one who um, interned with our organization, but offline, online. He was uh, helping with the publications of, of the organization. And, and uh, it's a very good organization anyway. So yes, uh, the pandemic indeed have offered, provided us opportunities. Now there have been lots of messages on the impact of, of COVID-19 uh, or the pandemic. One, uh, Tan Min Min mentioned about gender. So mm -hmm. she says that it has an impact on women's career because uh, they work from home for women balancing working full-time at the same time handling household chores. Though this is not necessarily negative or positive because you have more time to be with your family. So I think that's one of the impact on gender. But definitely uh, gender has a, has major, has a, is a major dimension in COVID. And then we have uh, Deborah from, from, I think, Australia. Uh, she mentioned that um, the Afro containment limit international arrivals, this was extraordinarily successful. So we are in the phase that uh, global health policies are being affected and testing definitely has been a challenge. So for me as a, as a researcher, we were able to publish a number of publications in different parts of the world, focusing on the pandemic in Mali, in Burundi, in uh, DRC Congo. So that was a bit of what I have been doing while being on lockdown in Manila. Until now, we are still on a soft lockdown. So that has been so, sort of uh, overproduction of publications, but in a, in a good way. Um, Can I add something on that? Uh, go ahead, please. Your point? So some of my colleagues, as you know, my female colleagues tell me that due, before the pandemic, we had a lot of travel, global health involves travel. And they were struggling that with the family and children, the impact of children when they leave the children uh, days or weeks. And also they were feeling the threat that male colleagues are doing it more so they can't completely avoid the travel part. They had to do that, but still knowing that young children have impact. But with the pandemic, one thing is none of us are traveling. And some of them are feeling, I don't have that feeling that I have to compete with my male colleagues anymore to keep up with uh, family time uh, and the traveling. And I'm happy that I could work like this and deliver at the same level. Uh, 
taking that talk. So there are some positive sides, but I completely agree in certain cultures uh, as female professionals may be having more work responsibilities or family responsibilities, which may have an impact. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's a positive side also some colleagues are experiencing that which post due to travel and being have to be away from the family also. So I think we need to look at both sides, not only one side. Thank you. Correct, correct. Um, so we have another uh, contribution from Sanka. By the way, please feel free to uh, to voice out. You can you can put on your uh, video and microphone, and you can you can help in the discussion. And maybe Kremlin can also read the other parts. Well, I mentioned this one from Sanka. Um, definitely, M Health apps SMS will change, uh, the, it will become a, a major trend in the near future. We have to make use of information technology. I have been teaching online for 10 years, even if it was not uh, before, people were not really interested in doing online, but now everyone is like an online expert and lecturer. I am with the online program of the MSc Global Health Policy of London School of Hygiene, and everyone is just enrolling. I have been with the online program of the Master of Public Health program of the University of Liverpool, and that has been done for almost a decade. So new opportunities for all of us. And then we have, uh, we have uh, Saran from Bhutan. He's a medical officer uh, in a referral hospital in Southern Bhutan. Uh, we had lockdown and restriction and free movement. Although our hospital and nearby health centers are organized, uh, have organized mobile clinics to provide consultations. So pro probably it changed a bit how they do services in the country. So that's one impact. So maybe we start to embrace the concept of, of, of new dimensions and frameworks and paradigms in services. In fact, we might change some laws on like, for example, here in the Philippines, the law says to provide consultation, you have to do it face to face. And that's mm -hmm. the law. We definitely have to change it because uh, people are doing it online now. And that's a way of embracing. It's a bit uh, adjusting to online education is a bit uh, difficult for some. But now things are actually changing. Are you reading some, Kremlin, you want to uh, react to or Koji? Uh, no, I think uh, there are some, so one of the colleagues asked about WHO COVID-19 response. It's all, I don't think I should spend time, but it's all on the website. I'll try to put the link here where we lay out once a month, we update our response. Okay. And that's just a specific place uh, for that on the uh, uh, website. The online uh, aspect is the data. I think the COVID-19 has really shown us the importance of electronic health records and use of data. So we can prioritize and reach the people who, are, who needs those services. Countries who had invested in that were able to capitalize on it. Countries who invested on good health system and good electronic health records were able to use that data to develop models, to predict who needs our services and even going one step beyond to contact them so this is a presentation from Israel, right? so actually, who has an amazing uh, health record system by the insurance companies. So their health insurance companies, one of the ones called Clarit, they were able to develop a model where they can predict who needs our services before it even happens, and then call the people who are more likely to develop a complication beforehand and, and, and get in touch with the health system. So there are two ways. One side, if you don't have data, if you close down, People who need the services can't come to the primary health care. They develop complication and turn up in the emergency with a heart attack. Or other way around is having good data, good modeling, uh, good risk assessment tools where you can model and predict the outcomes, uh, predict the risk beforehand and get health system proactively getting in touch with them, right? And some countries are really developing that, that knowledge and expertise when they have good health record system. And there are good examples that we should look for, look from that side as well. We should not uh, forget those good developments happening during the COVID, the use of data and the power of AI and big data. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. So those who have been uh, providing their inputs to the discussion, we will be doing uh, proceedings, a publication out of this conference. So thank you very much for your rich contribution. Everything and not everything will be, will not be. Uh, I mean, all your contributions will not be wasted, and we will translate this into a, a publication so that we can impact more global health policy and practice. So let all your um, your thoughts uh, come out through the discussion. Saran Tenzin said that some of their patients uh, were lost to follow up, and that is really uh, probably because of you don't go to the, to the, especially in some rural areas, and that was one of the impact of, of the pandemic. Okay, let me see the other. There's another question here. What is the short-term and long-term plan for addressing the COVID-19 pandemic as uh, globally by the World Health Organization? Uh, it's a question from Gamma. Uh, I'll, I'll, put the link, I'll put the link down for that. I think that takes time to explain, right? So it's 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 at different levels, different responses. It's a it's a one hour discussion on its own. But I'll put you the link uh, to our yeah, side. Yes, that is there. true. So talking about COVID from the side of a uh, of publication as a as a managing editor of a journal, we are now looking at at uh, publication. So for some of you who are trying to uh, improve their CVs, doing publications and writing researches, commentaries, uh, letters, original articles would really help boost your, um, your careers in the future if you have to apply. And for the COVID-19, we are now accepting on researches on, on the vaccines and the vaccinations. We're not a bit any more interested in in, um, in the early part of the pandemic. We follow the trajectory of the pandemic. So if this is just for those who are planning to do uh, papers on, on the research. I think more or less uh, we have a bit exhausted the, the scenario of what the pandemic provided us in this one hour. But please feel free to, uh, to raise your hand if you want to say something. Uh, the participants. We will have a break in between the session, uh, toilet break and a uh, drink break. We still have a few minutes for discussions. Okay. Any other question? So, or we, uh, we move. Don, maybe a good thing to ask whether one of the participants can at least explain whether their career or the work stream of their career has significantly changed as a result of the pandemic. It could be changed towards something you enjoy or something you don't enjoy. It doesn't matter, but it'd be really nice to hear at least one example of yes, where correct. I know all of us have working conditions have changed but whether the content that where you have to learn new skills and apply it has changed as a result of the pandemic. And, and it would be really interesting to hear that experience from one of you. That is correct. We'd like to hear from the participants. Again, the impact uh, individually, the micro impact of the, of the pandemic. Do you, that's a nice question. Are you enjoying your work from home or? <laughs> I have been working from home since March uh, 15 because we started the lockdown in the Philippines and it's very strict here at the very start. Until now, so it's eight and a half months. I was only able to go out of my neighborhood after eight and a half months. So I was able to go scuba diving here in the Philippines and that was really a relief. Yes, what happened to the others uh, during the pandemic? So here in the Philippines, we have curfews. You cannot go out. There was a time that the, only the groceries were open at a certain period of time. So we had to, uh, to buy uh, in bulk. Any, um, any volunteer from the participants who would like to say something? What happened to them personally? Hello. Yes. Hi, Hasara here from Sri Lanka. Oh, hi. Um, 
Hi. So um, I'd like to share my experience because um, we are doing a project on international research project called Eclipse on uh, leash menaces. So the project team have not had a chance to, um, you know, talk to each other in person. So we are using teams to connect with each other. And, you know, we are, um, we are a team of uh, Sri Lanka, Ethiopia, UK and Brazil. So it has been amazing because um, we get, got to learn all the skills with um, online platforms and how to deal with each, each other and, you know, not to make this a burden and move on. But of course, in the, on, on the other hand, we are losing, you know, the physical touch on everything. Yeah, so that's, that's. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, that's helpful. Uh, so, and that's good that you learn those skills. And as I said, there are certain skills we are struggling to deliver, as I mentioned, the transfer analysis in the lab. There are certain skills we can learn, but the other thing is uh, we are now able to connect with different countries uh, at a low cost and share that experience, which has made uh, certain aspects uh, even stronger. And none, not, nothing related to COVID, but in the past, we would have only thought about these opportunities as physical meetings, physical trainings. We wouldn't have think about them as online training or to successfully deliver online training. So we would have uh, operated in a small budget, bringing only few people together, but now you can bring a teams together, not just one person from each team in online and then continue those learnings. I think that's really what we are beginning to see, not just in projects, but also in policy work. That recently we organized a meeting about soil reduction. Everyone, not everyone, but in many countries from Brazil to Australia, it was midnight in Australia, early morning in Brazil. Yeah, that's a challenge for our life, but they all, all could come together and share the experience in a big group and without uh, spending money. So that's uh, that's the good side. And of that. Yes, that's the only challenge when you are you have to attend a meeting and it's midnight in your in your yes. time. Okay, we have uh, someone from Bhutan who raised his hand, Saran. I'm actually working with Saran on a few publications. Yes, go ahead, Saran. Please share your experience. Thank you, Dr. Don. Greetings to everybody. Um, I'd just like to share uh, some of my experience. I think. Uh, COVID-19 has had a significant impact on my career and uh, three things actually. The first was uh, it expedited my um, employment actually because I was just completing my uh, one year internship to get my full license to practice uh, and I was I finished in July. Um, however, in Bhutan, we don't have private practice and all governments are taken in, uh, all doctors are taken in by the government sector. However, they have a single window period of recruitment in January. So that would have left me unemployed for six months between July to uh, December. However, because lockdown happened and there was an acute shortage of doctors uh, and all health professionals for that matter, we were expeditiously recruited, uh, uh, what you call uh, bypassing the normal rules. So that was the first positive impact it had. After I got recruited, the second impact that I realized was I was sent to Southern Bhutan, which was considered to be the red zone because we were uh, uh, in the border areas and lots of uh, local transmission was uh, suspected. And uh, in the hospital, what they did was they set up flu clinics where all patients with flu-like flu symptoms would actually turn up at the flu clinic and we would have to run it. And this was my first posting as a full-time uh, full medical officer handling patients. So I had expected a lot of clinical difficulties, but then what I ended up uh, facing was that all of these patients came in and we started doing these rapid uh, diagnostic COVID tests on them. And some of them started getting positive results. And as soon as a positive result came in, then uh, the whole protocol would set in, be set in motion whereby I have to start doing contact tracing, uh, call my seniors, inform them of the result, um, uh, diverge the news to the patient, and then do a lot of logistical work and also think of my team, how do we self-isolate after that? There was a lot of protocol to it. Uh, but then what it put me through was a very managerial position right at the beginning. And that was something that I was not fully prepared for. So I think uh, that was something that was very interesting, a big challenge. Uh, but uh, with time, we got uh, used to it. And the third impact that it had was 
because of uh, the severe shortage of doctors, I wouldn't normally have been granted leave to attend uh, conferences like this, for example, but because all these conferences are now online, so the, uh, the positive side was that now I'm able to actually attend this and then actually speak to you all. So those are the three impacts that COVID-19 had on my career. Thank you very much, Saran. That was really very nice uh, sharing of experience. Uh, in fact, um, one thing that we are, when, when I learned that, so I, I, got, I do research on Bhutan and I, I have published a bit. And one of the things that we saw was that they were recalling all the doctors being trained abroad. And when I, when I saw that, when I heard about this, um, uh, when I heard about this, I made it sure that we come up with a publication recalling doctors to Bhutan because it was a unique, um, a unique experience of a country. So he mentioned a bit that. And another impact of COVID, of course, is in the US, they made all the medical graduates graduate very, very fast so that they can be deployed. And we're thinking of writing, a, we have started writing a paper on this as an impact on the health systems. Thank you very much, Saran, for that sharing of your experience. Kremlin, you want to say something before I yeah, close was, the session? Uh, good. No, I think the, yes, in one sense, as you said, you don't need to travel. You can join any conferences. On the other side, what's happening is we are not really asking for time off to at attend such training and conferences. And then the organizations might expect us to do our normal day-to-do -day work in the same routine because there's no difference whether you are at work or whether you are doing a training. And that's putting a lot of pressure. I see one of the comments, uh, I think it's from Sonali, with my experience, many I know, uh, sorry, I lost that now, which saying that there's no real difference between timeline or, or, or work time and home time that we are dragging on uh, without any time. I think that's the side that we need to be aware of not to get burned out. And there's lots of uh, work around it now. You might see uh, in uh, publications, uh, especially a lot of organizations asking everyone to block the lunch hour in their calendars. Otherwise, meetings just get booked in and you might not uh, have that break in your daily uh, work time. And I think the not being able to stop could be a problem even if you went to work, right? So we should not put that in the context of COVID that I can't really draw the time between my work time and office time. It's a skill that we need to develop anyway, regardless of whether it's COVID or not, really drawing that timeline because you can work home on, in the train, come home and start the laptop again. And that opportunity ex existed, but I think the we need to raise that issue. It's a real issue. People are raising it, not even having time for lunch or to go out for a short walk if you're allowed to go. And that we need to take in balance when we talk about doing training and attending workshops and conferences without taking time off from work. But I think it's a great opportunity that we could do it without spending travel money. And, and, and that we need to appreciate. Thanks, Don. With that, we finished our first hour of the session. We provided the landscape of what COVID uh, of the pandemic did to our, uh, our work and to, to global, though it was not exhaustive, at least we were able to uh, see what happened to, to, the, to the world uh, based on our sharing. We'll have a short break, uh, drink break, toilet break. Uh, we also need to have breaks during um, during online sessions and classes. So we'll have five minutes and then I will give over to Kremlin to handle the second session. Thank you very Thank much. You. We'll join in five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Don't let me know you think you I want to actually suggest that we take a photo in a few minutes. So that means you'll be prepared to switch on your camera for a few seconds for us to take a screenshot later, maybe in a few minutes. We'll give you a little bit more time. So feel free for that. And then uh, although we can't come close together, at least we will have some memories and we'll share that later on with everyone who participated. Um, let's do that in a few minutes when we start. In one minute, Don, can you start in a minute, do you think? Yes, please. During the break, you can, everyone can also talk informally. So you can test your microphones if we can hear you. <laughs> Let's make this informal. You wanna test your videos? 
Yes, we have that's a good pages. thing. You might have to test your videos because we are going to take a photo. We're going to ask you to switch on the camera for a few minutes. No pressure, invitation. Oh, see, we have, we have a lot of participants. They should be uh, talking. Yes. Oh, I see uh, familiar faces. So, uh, for, but the backgrounds, they normally place, like they put the beach uh, on their background. So they, yeah. you feel that they're not in Bhutan, but they are in the beach of Sri Lanka. <laughs> yes. Right, I think uh, we could start the session too. So during this session, uh, in a few minutes, we'll take a photo, just in one minute maybe. Uh, I'll first explain what we are going to do. So I think the first session, we were mostly focusing on the global landscapes during the COVID-19 period. Now we want to start looking at opportunities and then really in the next session to go talking about way forward, right? How do we navigate and prepare ourselves? So when it's talking about opportunities during this session, we want to hear from you. What have you already seen as the opportunity? What are you waiting for until the pandemic ends or lockdown ends? So you want to do something new? Have you, or are you really waiting to do what you wanted to do January, 2020? Or have you found out something new? What opportunities we have brought in? That's the discussion we want a little bit for 10 minutes. Then we are going to go into groups. I'll tell you what questions we would like you to uh, do in groups. I think each groups will have about uh, five to six people. We will break into eight groups. Uh, make sure that you talk to everyone, exchange your forward, email addresses or contact details. That's important because we used to have those coffee breaks before the conferences where we met many colleagues from different countries and exchange contact details and business cards which we can't do now. Zoom webinars have become places where you come, listen to someone and leave, but we don't want to do it like that. We want this session to be a networking session, meeting people, new people, new like-minded colleagues and exchange your contact details. So group work is not just about talking about our questions, but also about exchanging your contact details. And then we come back and join the uh, group three. So that's the plan for this hour, at least for the session two. Right, can I please invite you to switch on your camera and I think the SLMA team will try to take a screenshot. So there are more than one screen and uh, please make sure you print the both screens. Uh, can I get a confirmation uh, uh, that uh, when it is done, please switch on your camera so we can have a group uh, work uh, group. Uh, I'm checking with uh, Viganga. Are you okay to do the screenshot, Viganga? And I, will, I will also do it from my side. So we have Thank a backup. You. That's good. Give a okay. smile, please. Oh, we have Give a baby. As much as you can. <laughs> okay. Join the group photo. One, two, three, smile for page one. Please wait. Okay, one more for page one. One, two, three, smile. Okay, we go to page two. There you go. One, two, three, smile. There's Professor Indica on page two. One more for page two, please. Okay. Then we go to page three. This for our documentation. One, two, three, smile. One more. One, two, three, smile. Very good. Back to you, Kremlin. Thank you very much. That was good. We will share those group photos with you, okay, at the end of the session uh, with other PowerPoints and etc. Right. So uh, that's that. And uh, can I take, uh, yeah, before we break into groups, can I take one question? Please uh, raise your hand or put it in the chat. What are the kind of, now we are going to talk about the opportunities. What new opportunities have you identified that I really want to do this? Oh, this is opportunity. And please uh, either speak or share that, that's something that you are waiting to start or going to start after the pandemic or new, it could be a new training, it could be a new project, but which became as a result of the pandemic, according to your understanding for your career. Uh, please start typing or raising your hand. Uh, Don, I'm going to ask you actually, Don, do you have something that you really identified during the pandemic 
that uh, you want to do now uh, after the pandemic as an opportunity for your career? Um, actually, I had lots of... Um, there were many opportunities that came to me after the, <laughs> after the pandemic. Like mo many research uh, grants were just pouring. I have like a 25 million US dollar research grant. <laughs> so that means a full-time work. I have a disaster grant and because everyone was just working from home. So it was a good opportunity for me. And now I have to navigate which ones I have to. So these for the young researchers and young career for those who are navigating their careers. Um, you just network properly. That's what I want to uh, say. And then things will just uh, fall into pieces and come to you. And Thank networking you. helps a lot. Thanks, Don. Uh, I see from Deborah, I have learned basics in technology, Zoom, digital communication. I hope to continue electronically, yes. Uh, people might who have not thought about careers work distantly or do completely distance-based careers would have now have more confidence in doing so rather than just looking for locations relocations and working and organizations may be more uh, acceptable for that and uh, as a global health card we might be taking those opportunities more i saw the hand raised earlier sorry who was uh, alexander did you have the uh, hand raised to speak uh, feel free to take the floor. Uh, hello. Hello, yes. Prof. Kremlin. Hello. We can hear you very well. Please speak. Uh, hello. Yes, Alex, go ahead. Uh, can, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Yes. Uh, this pandemic has taught me um, new things, new skills, actually. First of all, it's uh, technological skills. I mean, all the while I've been doing research, like we have face-to-face -face meetings, uh, going to the field, collecting data, and uh, having uh, most of the time having face-to-face -face or group meetings. But now, uh, through this uh, pandemic, uh, since there is a lockdown and movement control orders, uh, I've learned to adapt to new way of doing research, which is by communicating through Zoom platforms, Microsoft Teams, and through my institution, I've also organized uh, various talks, workshops, and we always in continuously, we are trying to, uh, in discussion of how to bring, translate all those uh, 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 research discussions or research input into online platforms so that it can be translated to wider, uh, uh, what do you call that, wider amount of uh, audience. And also new way of doing research such as um, uh, uh, doing online researchers mm -hmm. and then having Zoom meetings have really taught us many new skills. And of course, last but not least, I have more time to write my papers because apart from my administrative duty, since I have more time at home, so it allowed me to write and focus more on my writing career. So that's all from me now. Thank you. Uh, can I just add something? Uh, Alex is uh, is my student in global health uh, before. In fact, we wrote a paper, a collaboration of different countries on COVID in one ASEAN country. So that was one of the examples that we had on, I'm, on, on, on online cooperation and collaboration. So I'll be happy to work with some of you who want to publish papers. And Alex was the one who uh, did the first uh, authorship. And same with some of the other participants here. We worked online to come up with publications. So that uh, embracing online technology for cooperation, collaboration is one thing that uh, we will learn. Uh, we learn from this COVID Kremlin. Thank you. I see a few comments about online training for rural community. Yeah, I think, I don't know about the uh, I agree with that. I don't know whether you are talking about as a career, so we can develop training. That could be a career for public health professionals, right? Developing online training for rural health community workers could be part of your new work as an opportunity. And, uh, or if you are a public health professional working in a rural community, you can have more access to training opportunities as has been mentioned here about webinars and other things. I completely agree on that and, and we are now investing more in developing online training because earlier if we had some doubts I, I agree i have heard from many experts they had some doubts about giving certain competencies especially training healthcare workers through online means but since we don't have option now we are trying them 
and they are becoming nice experience. So I think people are going beyond their doubts to invest in online training. And there is a opportunity uh, to develop those training programs with the public health perspective, not just handing over that training to uh, video developers or multimedia developers, all right? So I think there is, don't underestimate the role of public health in development of that online training. I'm sure medical education will evolve to understand those changes and how we do, how we should do things differently. So online training is one strong aspect I came here during this chat, uh, being able to follow more and more online certificate courses. So getting more qualifications, learning new things, doing new courses seems to be another opportunity. Uh, I think those are the bits I can see. How to communicate through social media? Yes, there are two things. We are learning how to communicate through social media. I, I want to touch later about the social media misinformation issue. There's an infodemic, lots of information going in social media. And people, some people are struggling to filter through that. So how to train communities to navigate social media or information, look fact-checking, quality information, that's going to be a huge public health field in my opinion. And even as organizations, we are trying to learn what we can do to manage misinformation related to NCDs. My example was about alcohol and COVID. Social media platforms are trying to learn how can they use fact checkers and others while taking their profits, but they are also at the huge pressure to do something. So yes, we are learning to communicate, but at the same time, I think there's a huge public health role and a space to address this misinformation issue and work professionally doing research and also finding ways to address that. Uh, important or uh, should start and we can go ahead by addressing all difficulties we met. Yes, that's true. Right. So I think next we are going to go to a uh, group work. But before going to group work, we want to give you some energy for your group work. And one of the challenges we are facing is uh, that we spend too much time sitting down. Our sedentary time has gone up with the pandemic because we don't walk to the bus stop, train station or even to the car park sometimes join meetings back to back on Zoom. End of the day, we might have thought my sedentary lifestyle increase, although I'm a public health professional. Can we do some small things like taking breaks or lead by example? So I think today we have a video that we are trying to follow for five minutes. I invite all of you genuinely to join this in the spirit uh, with Don and Koji, who's going to lead uh, following the video. And uh, simple thing, please uh, take some stand SLME team, can you uh, screen that short video, uh, please, uh, the exercise? And uh, yeah, just follow this video, very simple stretchings we can do in a meeting, okay? And if we can practice these kind of things daily, we could perhaps uh, make a small difference. So I'm waiting for the SLME team uh, to uh, start this video. Please stand up and feel free to stand up. Find some space behind your seat and uh, Follow the steps, very simple steps. I'll mute my mic in the meantime. And then we join back into... Relax your arms by your side. And let's start by taking one full breath together. So we take a deep inhalation and a long exhalation. Now you can move your shoulders back, rolling them. See if you can stand tall with your chest a bit lifted. And relax your arms again, shake your hands. Shake your arms. And see if you can find the space and the balance at the same time to shake one foot and maybe the whole leg. You can grab onto something if the balance is tricky. And you can try the other side, so just shaking, shaking one foot and the whole leg. Very good. And come back to the center. Now lift your arms up as much as your very elegant attire allows and back down. Lift your arms up again. And down. Now see if we can do this and breathe at the same time. So we inhale and lift the arms. 
and exhale down. Inhale up, exhale down. Very good, we have this one. So inhale, lift up, and next time you exhale and you bend your knees just a little bit. Inhale, lifting up, and exhale, bend your knees as much as there's space. Inhale, exhale. So we continue, you can do this at your own pace, trying to follow your breath. If there's space and if you feel like it, you can take a bit of a deeper squat. Remember to breathe, remember to smile, enjoy a bit of physical activity. Maybe you want to increase the pace a little bit and get the blood flowing. Remember to still breathe. Good. And you can do three more, last three. And once you did the last one, you can relax your arms by your sides again. And we will take three deep breaths again to relax. So inhale here. Exhale, relax your shoulders. Inhale. Exhale. Last breath, inhale. And exhale. Thank you for joining that. I hope you joined. Uh, just to practice a little bit what we preach. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's good. It's good to get some energy in these long workshops. I hope you all got the heartbeat a little bit up. Not so much. Just enough to go to the work group. Uh, so that work knows, group. is what you will be doing when you work for NCDs at WHO. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Finding every opportunity. I am typing something... Uh, to the chat. I hope uh, you will be able to make a copy of that. I think this will stay when you go to the group, so not a problem. These are the questions for the next session. How do I prepare myself for post-pandemic? What skills do I have to retool to prepare for new opportunities and where can I find support for that? Right? You might have an idea what you want to do or new skills you want to achieve or how you want to work differently. But where can you find support uh, and qualifications? Uh, where is it available? Or how can you find where it's available? What are our expectations from global health leadership? If you think about this as early career, as all of us are at some stage, we still want to develop our careers. What do we expect from the global health leadership to provide us, right? So three questions. We are going to talk for about 35 minutes uh, from now and then come back to the main room. What's going to happen is uh, when I finish the explanation, SLMA team is going to put us into about uh, uh, four or uh, sorry, about eight or ten groups. So each group will have about uh, five, six people. Uh, maybe about uh, we have about forty-five. So eight, uh, yeah, maybe eight groups. Eight groups, please. Uh, you will be going into a group. So each group will have five or six participants. Please take time to introduce yourself, exchange your email address, do the networking, don't underestimate that. And then you discuss these questions. How do I prepare myself for post-pandemic? What skills do I need? Where can I find these training opportunities? And what do I expect from global health leadership to help my career? And, uh, and think what are the responses that are common to most of you? So, Pick the top ones that's relevant to almost everyone or the most common ones from your group. And please appoint someone to facilitate your group work and someone to take notes, a rapporteur from each group. And then we will send you a message uh, when it is 35, 30 minutes. So you know there's five minutes left and then you can come back. Uh, we will bring you back to the plenary room, this room and then you could share those three, top three uh, that you felt. You can, if you have a very burning point that's very personal to you, you can share that, of course, but at least share the top three uh, points that everyone in the group felt important. And then uh, Koji will uh, make a presentation about from as, a, as an academic, how does he look at this issue way forward? What does he do now and the challenges and future? So. We will have a presentation from Koji and we will have your group feedback, which we will put together to continue the discussion in the uh, session three. 
So I hope it's clear. If it is not clear, please raise your hand or ask the question now. Indika, did you want to say anything at this stage? Uh, just to just to mention that uh, this will be random allocation, uh, like. Uh, everyone will be randomly allocated for the room. So sometimes uh, three of you also might find in the same room. Doesn't matter. I mean, let uh, you have clearly explained what is expected. So, I mean, once you uh, get into the room, feel free, introduce yourself, have a good discussion. And once the time is over, then we'll be bringing back to the main area. So yes. let's make it random. You, 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 we can make it manual also that it might take some time. Yes, and, uh, do a random, yeah. We will bring you back, yeah. But uh, just to let you know, there will be two options when you are in the breakout room, okay? Leave the meeting and leave the room. So please don't click leave the meeting. <laughs> if you only leave the room, then you will come back to the plenary. That's very <laughs> important. Just to let you know. That's very, very important. Yeah. Okay, uh, let, let's, let's start breaking. So, yeah. yeah. It, it, it will be random allocation. Okay, thank you. Enjoy the group work and we'll see you soon. Please take, uh, this chat will be there and the questions are there. If you need, make a note. Uh, please appoint a facilitator and a rapporteur, please. So uh, very soon you will be finding yourself in one of the eight rooms. There are eight rooms available. Thank you. So we are opening the rooms. Now you will be find yourself going into the rooms. Don, how was it? Everyone's coming back. Uh, everyone's coming back. Yes. yes. We don't have a shout now to come into the room, right? That's the one good thing of uh, Zoom breakouts, Don. Yes. Ah, so yes. Now um, <laughs> we have one hour left. Uh, let's wrap up the session to uh, Kremlin. Yeah. Shall we wait, wait a little bit now? Still, if you are joining, they might have gone to the washroom and then sure. coming back on the way. Okay, so let's have a five-minute break. We come back. Yeah, in, why don't you uh, take five No, no, let, uh, I mean, two or three minutes would be okay. Now they are joining one by okay. one. We can have yeah, an informal chat. Yeah. Let's see people uh, showing their faces uh, online. Feel free to get a drink, water, and... Uh, I'm, yeah, actually, so. I'm actually speaking in another conference now, but they asked for a video presentation. <laughs> Conferences now are demanding. They all want video presentations. <laughs> yes. And um, I was in a workshop uh, yesterday from our coach, WHO coach. They were talking about communication and why people are tired after long Zoom meetings. So this is a question until others come. If someone can answer in the chat, do you know in communication, how much is our word answer the question, what percentage is body language? So we communicate with someone or a group uh -huh. and in our total communication, type in the chat, what percentage of that communication is attributable to the body language? It is 10%, 20%, 50%, 60%, uh, put in the chat until others come. What percentage is the body language? 50% body language, I see one answer. Yeah, I'll give a couple of 10 seconds more, others to go. What do you mean, uh, Kremlin? The body that means I'm talking to you, right? I'm talking to you and uh, we are mm -hmm. communicating. I'm okay. saying some words mm -hmm. and I have my body language. In terms mm -hmm. of understanding the whole conversation, how much my words contribute and how much my body language ah, contribute. Okay. Right? And uh, right, I have 70%, I have 90%, 50%, 80%. 80% is correct. Okay, so that's the apparent research is 20% words, 80% is body language. Is so that what happens normal is normal communication or in yeah, Zoom? Yeah, yeah. So what happens is in the Zoom, when you don't have a video, when you're only listening to voice, our brain is working 80% extra hard to figure that bit out. You're only hearing a voice without a body language but uh, your brain is working harder to make sense to that and that communication. Oh. And that's why we feel more tired at the end of Zoom calls. And that's why it's now some organization, it's default that you have to use cameras, which makes it easier for everyone. And brain is feeling less tired when everyone had communication. Oh, okay. uh, that's, yeah. Yeah. So just a fact, yeah. Uh, I learned it from our coach on Friday, okay? 
and um, uh, so that's <laughs> sure. Okay, so uh, let's. I think everyone is here. Don, shall we ask people to start? I mean, this, these two sessions are linked. So session two is closed actually. What happened is they are going to feed back what they discuss to this group, uh, to this plenary now from the group two, from session two, from the group work. And then we are going to also link with uh, Koji's presentation. Don, what do you want to do? Listen to the group feedback first and go to Koji and then have the discussion. Shall we do that as the session three starts uh, yes. now? Uh, let's have first Koji because they have been talking rather than they talk again. So let them rest and then we'll have Koji first and then we go to the presentation. Good. Professor so Koji, are you ready? Yes, yes, yes. He's yeah. always ready. He's always uh -huh. ready. <laughs> <laughs> so colleagues, just to explain, first Koji is going to speak. So please uh, yeah. prepare yourself to feed back to the group with the key points. First uh -huh. we listen to Koji. And then we listen to the feedback from group. Over to you. Okay. Thank you, Don. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, everybody. We already spent for two hours. Maybe everybody's getting a little bit tired, but uh, let me make a short talk about uh, this, you know, topics about 10 minutes. And I am going to talk about uh, some academic experience. Uh, before COVID-19 and uh, during COVID-19 and maybe for the future opportunity uh, for the uh, our, you know, career development. Then especially, you know, I focus on uh, uh, today's topic and this is a third point. I will make, uh, you know, some idea of the for your career opportunities, career development. And I just talk uh, only already talk about my self introduction. I just show you the some, you know, what I worked here uh, since my postgraduate study. And actually, I studied in the United States, and I was in Florida, and I joined the lymphatic filariasis project as a MPH student in Haiti, in a small country. And after graduating MPH program, I moved to the Panama. And I joined the HIV AIDS control project in a government hospital. And I worked for the compile and analyze the data of the HIV patient uh, antiretroviral therapy over there. And when I moved back to Japan, uh, I live here, northern part of Japan, and I joined the PhD program. And during the PhD program, I had a great opportunity to visit Sri Lanka because my university and the University of Peradeniya in the Kandy district, they have an exchange program. So I live in a department of community medicine in the faculty of medicine for three years. And I joined the several epidemiological research on the rabies, HIV, AIDS, and more other more disease as a PhD student and even a I received, a, obtained a PhD. I spent another two years for the postdoctoral study and located in Kandy district. And in the meantime, I also worked as a voluntary NGO staff in Cambodia. And I worked for the health promotion and health system project over there. So I frequently visited Cambodia to implement the project. And uh, <clears throat> after these studies, um, I had a chance to work in the JICA or Japan International Cooperation Agency. It's a governmental organization. And uh, in JICA, what I did is uh, implement and manage the public health project in both Asia and African countries. And particularly my project is on uh, Thailand and Myanmar. In the later part of as a JICA staff, I was dispatched to the Myanmar to join the malaria control project. Uh, this is a collaborative project uh, between uh, Japanese government and uh, uh, Ministry of Health of Myanmar. So I work on uh, uh, how to eliminate the Myanmar in a local region in two years. Then uh, now I joined the current uh, university and uh, my research area moved to the Africa. Uh, I visited uh, Kenya, Malawi, uh, Ghana, and uh, Liberia. 
And I did uh, also the epidemiological research again. And also I enjoy uh, working in the capacity development of the public health official, including uh, medical officer of health, public health nurse and public health midwife. And uh, to these countries, I invite them to go to Japan and have a training and went back to the country. And that was my, you know, what I am doing before the COVID-19 pandemic. So, you know, we have two major duties in academia. Usually we have education and research. And for the education, as you know, you know, we as an academic staff are responsible for educate future medical professionals through lecture and the training. And the left top pictures derived from my university's leaflet showing various hands-on or face-to-face -face training opportunity for medical and nursing student. Left bottom picture, as I mentioned before, it's called the JICA training program the named health system management held in my university. Actually, this is targeted for the African public health official, but the JICA office, JICA offers various on-site training opportunity for young professional from Asia and African countries. And the right half of the slide, uh, this shows about my part of research activities. As mentioned before, uh, I my fieldwork goes to both Asian African countries. Here's a rabies work in Sri Lanka. This is a malaria work in Myanmar. And this one is also the malaria work in a community level in Malawi, South African country. All of them need frequent visit, site visit and extensive communication among local researchers and the people. So that was my academic duty before COVID-19. However, since last February, everything has changed. For education, for example, you know, Japan school start year start always April. So the freshman or first year student, they are not able to come to class. They were able to visit campus, I guess only one or two months so far. And uh, this month, you know, starting this month in December, you know, most classes have been held only again due to COVID-19 outbreak in my cities. And so far, you know, two employees in uh, our university got the COVID-19 infection. So the, now it's in a critical condition here. And also for this JICA training program, this one is postponed until now. And for the research on the right side, because I had, uh, you know, I need to travel the many countries before, but unfortunately there is no international travel. And even you know, no, domestic travel is not allowed by the universities, so I cannot do the you know field work so far. Also, you know, we can do ongoing research only. So no new research is allowed, and the laboratory use also limited. So we have a big restriction on the research work, and also the conference like this, you know. Uh, like this conference, you know, no on-site conference. There is a virtual main conference. So, you know, everything has changing in, uh, during the COVID-19 in the field of academia. So when we think about the career development before COVID-19, actually, you know, in a leaflet, you know, I was introduced as a professor, but uh, to tell the truth, I am still the assistant professor. So, you know, if I have to become a full professor, I need to do a lot of things to do. And especially for the research, you know, I need to do the field work and uh, collect the data. And I have to make a conference presentation. And uh, based on the data, I have to write a paper. And uh, based on the paper, I have to, you know, get the information back to the field. And to do this research, you know, I have to you know, get the money. You know, research needs always a lot of money. So the research grant, I have to get the, you know, from the government institution or some private companies to do the research. And for the educations, and uh, I also, you know, 
um, <clears throat> need to conduct a number of face-to-face -face lectures, tutorials, workshop, hands-on training, and maybe field trip for both undergraduate and postgraduate student. I guess these research and education assignments are more, uh, more or less similar to your countries, but uh, you know, if I think about uh, career development to be a full professor, and a lot of things to do in, uh, in terms of research and education. However, you know, during COVID-19 epidemic, you know, field work, you know, we cannot do the field work. Field work has been suspended, which means no data collections, no new data to present a conference, no data to write a paper, and no feedback to the field. However, it is good time to clean up the data which is not yet analyzed. And these data can be presented in a conference or used for writing a original paper. I have submitted one presentation in this APAC conference because I did not have enough time to analyze the data, which were collected more than one year ago. Also, it's also a good opportunity to prepare for the future research at this time, which means a time for fundraising for research grant application. And uh, we already discussed before in the first session, but uh, uh, usually, you know, I only have a uh, little time to apply for one or two grant application per year. But the, during this time, you know, just a few months, I complete four different research grant applications. All the applications are about, uh, you know, global international epidemiological research, including rabies, Sri Lanka, and the universal health coverage in Africa, I mentioned before. So we have to just think about, about future opportunity for the, you know, another field work. And education is the same. We have to manage new style of teaching, which is online-based lecture, quizzes, and even midterm or final exam. We have to conduct through online. Also, in some cases, we need to video recording of the teaching material in advance. <laughs> Actually, I did one for the class for practical training on public health and hygiene for fourth-year medical student here. I was in charge of environmental assessment for occupational health, so that my demonstration tape for noise measurement using device was video recorded, and the student watched and wrote the report through online course media. As a result, in terms of education, academic staff need much more work to prepare for the classes. Then we have to think about the career opportunities and the new normal. And for example, like, you know, we already mentioned in the previous sessions, you know, um, academic conference training workshop was shifted to online like this workshop. There are several advantages of this type of opportunity, such as on-demand watching and the cost effectiveness. We can watch various videos anytime, any places. And I hope we can also watch lecture and symposium in this APAC conference at later time also. And also we can reduce the cost of attendance and this APAC conference actually usually require 400 to 500 US dollars for registration among international delegates, but this time costs only 99 US dollars. Travel costs also huge burden. If I join a conference in Sri Lanka from Japan, I have to cover about 2000 or maybe 3000 US dollars for round trip ticket and accommodation. But at this time do not worry about money at all. But you know, as already mentioned, you know, person-to-person -person interaction is limited because we only have a virtual opportunities. Also, <clears throat> uh, sometimes, you know, you know, we, you know, have to, you know, think about the work in daytime or nighttime only because we are staying at home, you know, we don't have a time, we don't have a, it is not necessary for the travel, means, you know, to my case, I, I have uh, much more time to spend for the meeting, you know, meeting chance is very, very, you know, enormous. <laughs> and also, if we think about near future, you know, I can introduce some two opportunity in career development of global health, both of which are related to JICA and where I used to work. Then one of them is a JICA KCCP. KCCP means a knowledge co-creation program. Uh, this is a one or two months hands-on training opportunity in Japan as part of technical cooperation before COVID-19 epidemic. Approximately 10,000 
people from all over the world come to Japan and uh, had various lectures on the field visit. Not for Asian colleague, but I have also been in charge of the sub course leader of health system management for regional and district health management officer among African delegates since 2018. It's not designed for the researchers, but for public health officials, including medical officers of health and public health nurses and midwives. Sometimes the NGO staff can also join the program. This year's training course has been suspended so far due to the COVID-19, but online-based program has finally resumed and my program will start in the next January. So if COVID-19 is calmed down, online training will also start again for the online participant. <clears throat> JICA always recruits candidates from the relevant ministry, mainly Ministry of Health. If you need further information for the program, you can contact your JICA country office or relevant ministries. <clears throat> also, another opportunity is called SATREPS. Uh, SATREPS stands for the Science and Technology Research Partnership for Sustainable Development. This is a huge innovative research opportunity using Japanese official development Assistance, Japanese ODA. <laughs> JICA and some other institutions in Japan co organized research projects in four different fields of sustainable development. And one of the fields is infectious disease control. There are three main purposes of the research project here. And one of them is focusing on the capacity development of young researchers, both in Japan and part partner countries. So young researchers will have an opportunity of hands-on research experience through the project. And here are some examples of the Satellite project. You see, you know, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Mongolia. I guess at least one project is ongoing or has been implemented in each countries. And actually I was a member of the first one and this one, and it's built TV control in Thailand. <clears throat> This is a joint program among Tokyo University and the Ministry of Public Health of Thailand and Mahidong University. And I was, at that time I was a JICA officer and I had a chance to set up the research environment with other researchers of three institutions and initiate the project successfully. The project has already finished and they were successful in revealing genetic risk of tuberculosis and developing effective treatment for TB. And including this, all project information, I didn't show the website address, but all the information is available at JICA's office, uh, JICA's website. So you can obtain more detail, including contact information of each affiliation. So the kind of the summary of my slide. And uh, even though we have a difficult situation and uh, we don't know when we can finish the COVID-19 pandemic, and there is a Louis Pasteur famous quote, chance favored prepared mind. Under the difficult condition, we still have a chance and something to do for your career development. And in order to accept our unknown future, all we need is to do what we can do by one, one by one. So when I conduct the research, I always keep in mind that small scale project will make a bigger impact. So we still have a lot of things to do under this condition, especially in the field of academia. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we take direct questions to Paji first. Anything directly coming out from that presentation, you might have some questions or feedback for Koji, please uh, take the floor, raise your hand. I'll try to look at it or type it in the chat, please. Uh, if you have any questions to Koji. So Koji, I, 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 so I think I like your last point about uh, mm. the preparing ourselves. Mm. And, and, and I think uh, one of the points that I discussed in the group where I was is that they have been waiting to start a PhD in another country. But because the borders are closed down, they can't start the process, which means at least two or three years, locked is going to apply at the same time, mm. end of next year or so, right? So the competition would be higher. And mm. I think the point you put that preparing ourselves would put you in forward. Yeah, so there are a few people in the group who are waiting to start postgraduate qualifications, right? For them, what does preparing means now during the lockdown project, in your opinion? 
Well, you know, you know actually, you know, in my breakout room session, also the same, you know, we had uh, like a you know, PhD student and, uh, but they also always think about our future. And, uh, you know, actually the, for the research, you know, research topic is everywhere, every, every places. And the data is, you know, you know, even if we can collect, if we cannot collect the data, there is a secondary data is available, maybe tertiary data is available. And uh, we can do whatever, you know, just, you know, think about our future and uh, just we can do whatever we can do, you know, and, uh, of course, you know, if we, you know, do a research, you know, we cannot get the outcome within uh, three months, six months, always one year, two years, even for the paper writing, it, it may need more years. So just, you know, just, you know, believe ourselves and just do whatever we can do. And I think that is a very important message because, uh, you know, we don't have to do the many big things. Just small things is okay. But the small things, if we keep doing the small things, we can make a big impact in the future, maybe five years, 10 years. So just yeah. believe ourselves and uh, maybe having a good mentor and uh, just keep working. I think that is important even in this difficult situation. Thank you. I don't see any hands or questions uh, in the chat. Uh, John, do you have any responses? How can one prepare themselves specifically for who's trying to do a PhD or another qualification who's going to be waiting for the pandemic to be over and travel to begin where you can apply for other countries? What can you yes. do now? Um, so this is what we have been doing with my with an organic with a network that I founded. I think some of you have participated. Uh, Global Health Focus, we've been doing a lot of of uh, empowerment among youngish people and young professionals. And if you would notice, uh, Kremlin, Koji, myself, we all have PhDs. The good thing with having a PhD is you can actually shift from academic and then to international organizations or go back. So that's, that's a good way of navigating your careers. If you would notice, the, if you want to work for the World Bank, for example, the head of the World Bank was a medical doctor with a PhD. Some of the heads of the United Nations and WHO, after they get tired of WHO, they become deans of schools, like the former head uh, director general of WHO is now the dean of the School of Public Health in, in China. The uh, assistant director general, the dean of the School of Public Health in, in Hong Kong and so on and so forth. The former head, my boss, the former head of UNAIDS is now the head of London School of Hygiene. So you can go from one to another and that's how you prepare your career in the future so that you will always have um, a way of navigating it and you will always have a job. So right after I worked for full-time as a, as a associate professor for Liverpool, I was headhunted to run a think tank then probably I'll go back again to the academy. So that's my advice for the uh, global health uh, people like you and early career uh, people like you. Thank you. So please remember, try to remind which group you were, right? There were numbers. I think I was in group five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Please try to remind which group you were and be prepared. I'll call you in a minute until you prepare. Don, one question on the PhDs. What do you think about online programs now? Do you think in terms of the career that they should be waiting and waiting and try hard to go to another country and do the PhD or if there's opportunity to start and enroll in a PhD program now from a good university online, should they take it? Do you have any perspectives on that? A very good question. That is my field. I'm into higher education. Uh, I have PhD students who are based in uh, Botswana. And on your certificate, actually, it will not say PhD online. In fact, the only time you go to a university, uh, to that university, the possibility is um, only during your graduation. So that's with the University of Liverpool. Some of the staff members of the World Health Organization, uh, they were my classmates. And they were actually just full-time at WHO Geneva, but they were doing their PhD on health economics in the university. Johns Hopkins is a very good online program. 
And most of the PhD now is actually you just stay uh, in your field, do the work. And there are many kinds of PhD, by the way. PhD by research, where you just submit three publications and then you submit because you cannot stop uh, your work. So now that there's uh, post-COVID online education has been embraced, you don't have to stop working. You continue your education and then you earn money at the same time you earn a degree. So I would suggest go for it. The only thing is be very good with time management and be strategic on the way you navigate your work. Thank you. Uh, I think that's the thing. Uh, I don't see any job application, job announcement which says only with the PhD, which completed full time or anything like that. It's asking for a qualification. If you get a qualification from a good university, go for it. That's what I have to say. Don't postpone it. Uh, take the opportunity if the opportunity comes with a good university topic you like with a good supervisor, you would enjoy it. If those things come together, take it. Like, let's go for some feedback from groups. Group one, we had some questions. Hope you can remember the questions. Uh, and we were asking to kind of feedback your key uh, messages, summary of the discussions in terms of how do you prepare ourselves for the post pandemic? What skills I can or retool myself and where do those support available? What do I expect from the global health leadership or academic leadership? to achieve that. So those were the, on those three questions, key discussion points. Group one, someone from group one, let's go, let's uh, hear your voice actually. Let's go for it quickly, okay? Keep it to a few minutes, three minutes. Group one, please. Someone from group one, please unmute yourself and speak then. We are coming to group two next, so you can be prepared. Group one. Maybe you don't know. Did you know the groups? Uh, I didn't take down names who went to group one. Yeah. Who, anyone who thinks they were in group one, please speak. <laughs> or we can randomly get the any group. Then we'll just yeah. note down which group. Yeah. Okay, who's ready? Please, we need to start. Don't worry, this is just, uh, now we have, now we know each other very well. Group two then, I just, yeah. Okay, so Saran, go ahead. Yes, we are from group two, actually, I, if I can remember correctly, <laughs> right. Anyway, um, yeah, so uh, from our group to the, uh, to the three questions, the first one was how do we prepare for the post-pandemic period? I think uh, we've, uh, our uh, group members focused on uh, two aspects. One was on the personal front and uh, the other was on the professional front. Uh, I think on the personal front, they were just, uh, I think I'll start with the professional front. On the professional front, um, a lot of question, uh, the discussion hovered around online work uh, and online learning and teaching as well. So uh, I, actually in our group, we had uh, two of them who were um, uh, actually teaching faculty members in universities. And one of them was actually pursuing a postgraduate uh, uh, um, uh, degree um, and uh, what they felt was both learning online and uh, teaching online was uh, a big challenge so therefore uh, preparing post pandemically uh, uh, they wanted to uh, equip themselves uh, with more and more uh, what's called online uh, learning and teaching opportunities on the personal front uh, they felt that as a result of this uh, online juggle uh, I think for, uh, balancing work life uh, was something that uh, uh, that they really wanted to learn. So they were trying to uh, familiarize themselves with these. Uh, so that is what we came up uh, uh, to the first question. The second was what uh, uh, skills uh, do we need uh, uh, to retool ourselves and where can we find support for this? So again, uh, the discussion focused on online learning and teaching. And I think one very interesting point that uh, one of the participants raised was uh, she uh, is a lecturer to nursing students. So while teaching nursing students, uh, uh, while the theory part was easy, uh, imparting them with practical clinical skills was something that was very difficult because firstly, uh, uh, it is difficult anyway to do it online. And secondly, she felt that uh, uh, they did not have the required pedagogical skills to impart these kind of, uh, these kind of uh, uh, skills online. And thirdly, also because there were so many uh, technological barriers. So even trying to teach it online, uh, you know, how do you go about, how do you use these uh, softwares or even the uh, VD, uh, what do you call, uh, even the hardware that is available. So that was uh, another challenge.
challenge uh, that we discussed. And uh, the, to the last question, what were the expectations from the global health uh, leadership? Um, I think two important uh, or three important uh, points uh, came up. The first one was uh, the continued support for non-COVID activities, uh, and they were highlighting mental health and NCDs. So while COVID pandemic is being given a lot of uh, uh, focus, um, uh, making sure that the mental health uh, situation and the NCDs are not neglected, especially in the underdeveloped and developing countries, that was something that they really expected the whole world to come together and then tackle that as well. Uh, the other uh, important point that uh, we came up with was uh, technical support and funding in terms of uh, enabling the uh, the disparity in terms of both knowledge and skills, as well as the equipment that is available to enable online and digital uh, uh, interaction, both in terms of learning and education, as well as work. And finally, uh, we also uh, expected the globe. Uh, we also wanted the global health community to come together and make sure that if and when a vaccine comes through, uh, that the underdeveloped and developing nations are uh, equally included or at least there's some support system uh, that can uh, make sure that the vaccine distribution can happen so that uh, lives can go back to normal uh, at an uh, equitable pace rather than uh, the developed, nation, developed nations going forward while the underdeveloped nations still uh, uh, suffer from uh, having to acquire uh, vaccines. Thank you, Sanan. That's a good list. We know it down. Maybe we talk some more groups and then take everything. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for breaking ice and speaking on behalf of groups. Group one, if you are ready now, you could go. Group one, anyone ready to share? Group three then, until group one gets ready. Group three, group three or four, one of them. Who would like to start? Like Saran did, a quick feedback would be interesting to hear what you discuss. Group three, group three, anyone from group three? Group four, group four. I think it will be useful for participants to hear another voice rather than just three of us. So you're helping everyone else by speaking. So please come, don't worry. And please share some memories. Group four, doesn't have to be the rapporteur. Anyone who was in that group can say what they remember. You don't have to cover everything. Group three or four, Group five was the group that I was in. So I know at least there was one person there. Uh, shall we start? Group five, who want to speak? Uh, was it Karapati going to feedback? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Thank uh, you, Karapati. Yeah. Uh, we had a discussion uh, about uh, what are the preparation we need to make uh, for the post pandemic. Uh, uh, mainly, we uh, uh, got uh, two. Uh, aspect. One is uh, uh, because of uh, lockdown, uh, we have uh, more time and cost uh, uh, are saved. Uh, because of uh, this, we can use that time and uh, money uh, for the development of our academic uh, as, well as well as our research. Uh, the second one is uh, um, uh, because of lockdown, uh, uh, most of the uh, academic or the research or the training are conducted uh, by online. So, uh, according to our uh, perception, we are thinking that online teaching is more be uh, uh, teaching is better than face to face because uh, in the uh, online uh, teaching, uh, the students or the participant are more interact compared with face-to-face. Uh, uh, -face. So uh, uh, we need uh, to improve our skills in uh, online for the first questions. For the second questions, what are the skills uh, we need to develop? Absolutely, first one, we must need to develop our online uh, teaching as well as uh, uh, learning. So uh, we, we, uh, we discussed we need 
uh, the skills in uh, online learning so that uh, uh, that was the answer for the second questions for the last questions we are expecting uh, 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 leaders to provide uh, open discussion as well as uh, conference uh, for uh, research that the first one the second one is uh, uh, we are uh, expecting the financial support as well as uh, guidelines for the uh, uh, post pandemic uh, or during the pandemic uh, we expecting a uh, support finance uh, financially as well as uh, guidelines thank you thank you very much thank you for group 5 for sharing that that's good uh how about uh, group 6 group 6 or 7 and also i think we are getting so in the chat you might get some uh, screenshot of the groups if you can't remember which group you were in okay so check if you can't remember which group you were in uh, there must be some files coming through the chat i think they, it's, it's i think it's that sort they are <laughs> you have to open them and find out but group 6 if you know who was in group 6 you want to speak now group 6 anyone from group 6 uh hello hello yes i'm sonali i'm yeah i'm sonali uh, actually i'm not going to uh, go for one by one question but uh, i will summarize what we have discussed during our group discussion sir yes. uh, especially we have got uh, firstly we discussed about what were the difficulties that we going through during this pandemic period especially in our professions uh especially there were two uh, members of the group who were conducting community uh, not two three i think uh, community based field work so they have mentioned the difficulties in reaching or approaching the communities during this pandemic how uh, the community welcome these outsiders uh, or the researchers to their community and another main point uh, mentioned was that the difficulty in uh, obtaining the ethical clearance for uh, the researchers the new researchers mm -hmm. uh, during this pandemic period and uh, the next one was the difficulty in conducting clinical placements especially for the uh, professions in nursing career and uh, for the skills that we need to dis uh, develop we discussed that uh, the communication skills especially when dealing with the communities rural communities uh, the, the research researchers should have new ways of uh, communication to deal with the rural communities as uh, as the researchers we should also develop the adoption skills in this new normal how we have to progress and adopt uh, this kind of Uh, research seat to uh, research arena and uh, also finally we discussed about the advantages and disadvantages of uh, working uh, through the uh, online uh, actually uh, we had the both positives and quality uh, positives and negatives uh, especially for the disadvantages we were talking about how fatigue it is to conduct uh, the online sessions continuously and the long working hours Uh, that was the main constraint that we are having and in the advantages we were talking about that the save time for the transportation and all <laughs> so uh, that's the summary of our discussion so thank you thank you thank you sonali that is helpful sonali and you are in group 6 right am i right group 6 yes sir yeah, group 7 please group 7 hello hello yes sir hello yes sir yes sir alex Uh, Alexander here. So, sir, uh, like what Group Six uh, said, uh, we didn't go by the uh, number of questions, but we uh, summarize our discussion into two main themes. One is the challenges, and one is the opportunity. So, uh, the challenges is like what uh, Miss Sonali from Group Six said uh, just now. Um, medical students can't go for their community posting during this uh, period because. Uh, some of the villages in the um, uh, suburban or rural areas are quite scared to receive uh, doctors they might think that they bringing new infections uh, mm -hmm. from the hospital 
and then secondly as for the lecturer uh, dr vindia uh, she have said that uh, managing high number of students currently she is managing about 120 students and she has to break the lecture into about six sessions of 20 students per lecture and it's about a uh, repetitive lecture and it's kind of like uh, burning uh, i mean it kind of like causing a, a bit of burnout for her and students fall out during online lectures uh, uh, this was uh, also shared both by both uh, dr vidya and also dr hoy uh, stating that sometimes during online lectures students just don't be participative or, uh, or show any interest and in halfway when they have breakout sessions like this uh, uh, they just run away stating that uh, they don't have any good internet connections and also uh, those students who stays at a uh, Uh, suburban or rural areas are having uh, problems with the uh, internet uh, access uh, they have poor uh, lack of uh, connection so this is something that needs to be addressed by the universities of the institution and next is the opportunity uh, the sense of opportunity as research is concerned we save on the matter of cost time and logistic in doing research such as meetings can be done online discussions can be done online so we don't need to find uh, any particular time to do uh, any discussions uh, at one point because sometimes face to face meeting can uh, takes us a lot of time and also um, next thing is we learn about new technology on how to handle this uh, online uh, zoom and uh, microsoft team platforms and uh, and from time to time uh, among the academics and researchers we are uh, knowledge sharing is uh, actively occurring to improve online teaching like how to gauge or how to maintain students in a particular online teaching or research training sessions so academics as well as researchers are saying that okay instead of 3 hours of uh, online lectures maybe cut it down to 1 and 1/2 hour and in between give them some sort of like what we did just now like a breakout session uh, so that they it will entice a higher number of audience uh, attending the lecture and then the next thing is uh, we found out that uh, some of the students uh, in some institution through their confession pages so through social media they are complaining about uh, mental health issues uh, they are being depressed they are being uh, anxious because they can't attend um, classes uh, they can't join in lectures and have interaction with their peers so what i suggested is that we can do a, a mental health uh, a, a peer support group through whatsapp a telegram group uh, asking how students are doing are they doing good with their assignments are they facing any internet connection problems and how both the uh, academics as well as the students uh, researchers can address and help each other but then we have to take into consideration that students privacy and confidentiality need to take into um, yeah consideration so that we don't breach into their privacy uh, so that's all from our group sir thank you very much thank you for that very good feedback i really appreciate you taking time to do that group 7 thank you sir group 7 someone from group 7 please no no we are group 7 are oh, you group 7 sorry group 8 ah, i'm go. group 7 ah, alexander ah. okay sir thank you group 8 then group 8 i hope we have i think we had few in the group 8 uh, do we have the screen with the names of the group 8 please so they maybe they forgot which group they were yeah i am a group eight actually <laughs> oh, okay please ah right. oh, koji yes yeah <laughs> well you know actually you know all the group you know group 2 5 6 7 already they you know summarize also similar result from group 8 and the question why is just you know you know we can prepare you know what we can do you know because you know we don't know when to finish a post pandemic maybe two years to three years we don't know but uh you know we can do whatever we can so far you know in terms of research and also the you know training opportunities and as for the second question they also you know mentioned in the previous group that you know uh what kind of skill do i need you know maybe online course skill and also the communication skills you know we can make best use of the twitter and facebook on other social media and keep connection with others also you know we can you know we can conduct the new research so far but uh, we do you know 
you know, go back to what we did. And uh, if we did not complete anything before, you know, we can do some, you know, other data analysis or uh, other additional things to for the, you know, uh, prepare for new opportunities. And, you know, what can I find support for that? And uh, we got the idea that maybe, you know, even though, you know, we, we are the first time to have this kind of pandemic experience. Maybe we still can rely on the senior person as a resource person to whatever we can do. And uh, of course, you know, this workshop, maybe, you know, many of the participants is you know, expecting some, you know, get the resource of the idea from the resource person or senior person or colleagues. So maybe we can rely on the senior person to get the support for the future opportunities. And for the last one, you know, our expectation from global health leadership, maybe, you know, first we have to define the global health leadership, but uh, our ex one of the, our ex expectation will be that like, you know, how, you know, how the global health leader, they spread the collect information fastly because, you know, now the internet is available. We can get the information from many places. Maybe, you know, there is some, a lot of misinformation and uh, lay person maybe believe that this misinformation and uh, maybe get the wrong, you know, idea of the, you know, how to fight with this pandemic. So the, maybe the, for the global health leader, we expect, the, you know, how to spread, you know, they can spread the collect, not the wrong information, collect the information and as fast as possible. That, that was my, our discussion in the group eight. Thank you, Kadi. I think that was very good. So I think uh, we heard from all the groups. That was important. I, I, during my group and also discussion, I feel sometimes we are thinking about what I need to do my job, what support I need to teach the students, what support do I need to get connected with students. But also don't forget this is about our career development, right? I think it's, it's important that we focus on what do I want for my career development? What support do I need for my career also? It may be very closely linked to what you want to do in the job, but it may also have some different aspects than what you want to do in your job. So please, uh, this, this session we are trying on global health career development and how we could support each other in that process. I know this session is recorded by the organizers and also chat will be recorded. So maybe it's time in the last 10 minutes while we give some feedback, put other things that you want to be on record on the chat, especially the support that you need from a global health organization. So organization like APAC can think about how to provide that support. I heard during my group, you wanted more support on qualitative research writing training. I guess this is something specifically uh, it could be easily arranged if you put it out there. So write those things, what you need for your career, but let's focus on your career, not on your jobs, because we want to prioritize somewhere and the skills that you want to get and put it on the chat to a record. So Dr. Indika and others can review it later in their reporting and think about those next steps and follow up. We can't do everything, but all of us can do something. I think that's one of the lessons we can learn from that. Uh, Don and Koji, overall for what you heard from the groups do you have some feedback in terms of the focusing career going forward not so much focusing about the problems we are facing today but going forward any uh, key reflections and where we should focus our energy on over to you um yes uh there's one word which i want to uh, emphasize in this uh, in navigating your career there will be lots of innovations that is hurled upon us and we have to embrace these innovations. At the same time, we have to innovate ourselves, our skills, so that it will meet these innovations. What do I mean by this? For as a, as a practical example, the way we navigate uh, what I did, you can have jobs which is a, a far from, from where you are, and then I get paid as a managing editor of a journal, and that comes from another country, the salary. I teach at London School. The salary comes from the UK. It goes back to, uh, to my bank account, for example, in another country. 
And that's the same thing with the other kinds of jobs that I do, consultancy and the grant. So in other words, these are all innovations that the, especially now that there's a pandemic and there's a thought that it might be endemic uh, forever. So these innovations, try to see what they are and then try to see how you will work with these innovations so that it will not affect too much your life and your career wherever you are. And at the same time, you are actually building on and leveraging on these innovations. So that's just what I want to emphasize in this uh, workshop. Thank you, Don. I think that's very uh, helpful points, all of them. Dr. Indika, I might come to you for one of the questions if you're here. Are there suggestions for getting clinical practice parts, especially skills and competency during the pandemic? I think that's a valid question. There are clinicians. Dr. Indika, if you're here, do you want to respond now for that? Yes, uh, I think, Kremlin, that's a huge challenge because, I mean, uh, that's challenge that all the medical schools worldwide are facing as well. And probably there are no clear-cut answers because on, on one hand, uh, you have to safeguard the students. On the other hand, you have to safeguard the, the patients. At the same time, you need to give the training as well. So I think that the, the baseline principle is, I mean, uh, we are all health professionals. So in that case, pandemic or not, uh, then going to the field or going to the clinical settings is not, not avoidable. So probably it's a matter of having the appropriate training for the PPE and other preventive measures and then having appropriate measures to how to minimize the, the spread of the epidemic within the settings and uh, what are the measures that has to be taken if something happens. I think we need to have a clear guidelines on those areas. Another thing is we can think about the innovative technology, like say the video conferencing, I mean, even for clinical teaching, it may be possible to use some of those areas, online learning uh, or module based learning, virtual reality, augmented reality, those technological components can be used to the maximum, but I don't think the field training or the workplace paid training can be completely uh, replaced by the virtual part. So they are, I think the strategy should be how to minimize the spread in both ways. And then there may be new areas that we need to teach as well. For example, new skills, PP, donning and offing, preventive measures. So there may be new areas that we have to train them in an adequate way. So it's a challenge and I think it has to be look, looked at in different ways, different angles. But this is a challenge that all of us are facing at the moment. In a way, it could be an opportunity. Yes, thank you, Indian. I agree. I think we are all stretching our boundaries of what we could teach and what competencies we can give with online. And we will keep stretching that and going and reaching far and far, but there may be limits and that's the challenge and the opportunity. Kaji, overall reflections for the points you had, especially focusing about the career development for the future. What uh, can you reflect on what you heard from groups? Yeah, uh, actually, you know, just Indika said, you know, um, even the pandemic or not, you know, what we can do is I just think, you know, but uh, it takes a time, you know, to get the, you know, future outcome, you know, for example, for the research, you know, like my experience, you know, when I teach a master's student, PhD student, they always want to get the outcome soon, actually very soon, but, you know, research needs a lot of time, you know, you know, if we collect the data, you know, make a presentation, write a paper, you no, know, we cannot complete within one month. Always a year or two, you know, it takes a time a lot. So first thing is that we have to keep, you know, we have to believe ourselves, you know, even though, you know, even if we get, if we do not, you know, obtain a certain outcome, certain visible outcome, but we have to believe ourselves. And the second is that we, we have to have a good mentor. You know, without a mentor, maybe we just, you know, want to drop the university, drop the PhD course, something like this. But, uh, you know, as long as we have a good mentor, you know, we can do whatever we do. And, uh, you know, we, we don't know when the pandemic will finish, but, uh, you know, doing, uh, you know, academic work takes always a long time. So just, you know, believe ourselves. And, uh, you know, if we do some small things, you know, Later, we will have a, a, another good opportunity to, you know, work in a field of global health. That's my message. Thank you. I think, yeah, last minute. So feel free to type anything that you want to put in record, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, yeah, so 
uh, thank you, uh, Don and Kaji, both for those reflections. I agree with you, Don, when you say try to innovate ourselves uh, and do something different. Sometimes you are a bit bored doing the same thing online. And one way to address that is trying to do something new, reaching out to someone else. For example, if you haven't done work with big data sets, you have been only working with locally collected small data sets, it's the time to write an email to someone who holds that data set. They might like to chat to someone new. People are looking for that mental break. And it's the same for me when I get an email about work on misinformation and work a little bit on social media. It's not something I ever thought of, but I wanted a break from my normal work. I took the time, gave priority, becoming a passion for me. So if I can give a bit of advice, think about the thing that you are struggling to do, who could help you, take the energy and initiative to write an email and connect with that person that may open up new avenues. So I think that's what I can say. But definitely with Dr. Indika and APAC, if there are any small workshop trainings, we could organize these research methods. I see different things coming up. We'd be very happy to contribute. That's all. I think we are finishing on time. I'm going to hand over back to Dr. Indika Arunathilaka. But it is a great pleasure to meet all of you and to have your active contribution to keep the session on time. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Indika, for inviting us for this workshop. Yeah. And uh, thank you. Well done, everyone. Uh, the three resource persons, uh, Don, Kremlin, and Koji, and all the participants. It was really a fascinating experience for all of us. I think it's a novel experience as well The with a lot of interactive sessions. And within the limitations, I think this was a very, really great workshop. So one suggestion uh, is that uh, let's convert this discussion into a research paper. I think Don has already offered uh, that uh, he can allow this. And maybe we can get all the participants also co as co-authors with the discussion and chat coming in. And it would be a wonderful paper related to the early career and then how we can proceed and with different ideas. So maybe Don, it's all yours. And then uh, the next is that uh, from ECN, I think uh, Kremlin, you were uh, the, you were the chairperson several years ago, I think about 15 years ago. Yeah. and. Uh, I have been the senior advisor for many years and uh, the ECN has done a lot of work. One thing we wanted to do is to start the mentoring program. And we have tried it several times, but didn't work out. Maybe if three of you are willing to take the burden and take up as many junior uh, researchers as possible and guide them, maybe through online, I mean, you can, you can contact with them. Maybe at least if you can use, uh, I mean, uh, you do, do it in an unofficial way. I tried that with APAC uh, top level several times, but it didn't work out because, I mean, some of them were too senior. So maybe didn't have much time related to their other work. So why don't you take up this? And why don't you become part of the APAC advisory body? Kremlin, you can easily lead that. And uh, then uh, if you can volunteer as APAC mentors, mentors for the junior researchers. I can present that in the executive committee meeting that will take place in another one hour's time and uh, put their names as official mentors and get it appointed. And then we can uh, contact all the junior researchers who not only in this workshop, but in the previous ones also, and then allocated among few of you. Hard work for you, but uh, it would be a kind of wonderful service that APEC can do. What do you think? So let's let's try to do that. So great, everyone. Wonderful workshop, fantastic. And uh, looking forward to seeing all of you during the, the main workshop also. Don't miss it because it's going to be a really impressive, fascinating experience. And uh, my message during the next two days, that's uh, Tuesday and Wednesday APAC conference, expect the unexpected. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.